This is a game changer, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't just big for Twitter. This is big for all of social media. And most importantly, this is big. This is good for the people of the world. This is what we're talking about today. Welcome back, everybody, to Altcoin Daily, where you subscribe for our daily videos on everything going on with Bitcoin, crypto, the whole market. Like the video, support the channel, and let's jump right in. Maybe you've seen this, but did you get a chance to really digest this? So let me tell you, the CEO of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, has just put himself on record, and he has reaffirmed his commitment and dedication to an open source decentralized future. If you scroll down, he even goes on to mention Bitcoin by name. But let's start from the beginning because specifically what these tweets were about is how Twitter has hired a small independent team of up to five open source architects, engineers, and designers to develop an open and decentralized standard for social media. With this standard, Twitter will be a client of the protocol and not an owner of it. So think of this like email protocol, as in we all use email, we all use this protocol, but nobody controls it. This is like the internet itself, or like Bitcoin itself. Now the question is, can we do this for social media? And the answer is, well, Jack is certainly going to try, and he's gonna spearhead this by devoting resources and manpower to focusing on this. And in this Twitter storm, he goes on and he lists some problems with social media as it stands today. So he says one, one problem is the centralized mega corporations attempting to police this global standard throughout the world. This is unlikely to scale over the long term without placing far too much burden on people. I mean, think about it like this. Social media is this experiment that's only been around, what, 10 plus years? 10 years ago, social media was the antidote to corporate centralized control over us. Now today, social media is quickly turning into the centralized gatekeepers and authorities. Jack wants to try and change that. So, I mean, you can read this whole thing yourself, but let's just go over his final thoughts. He says, there are many challenges to make this work so that Twitter would feel right becoming a client of the standard, which is why the work must be done transparently in the open, not owned by any single private corporation, furthering the open and decentralized principles of the internet. And we'd expect this team not only to develop a decentralized standard for social media, but to also build open community around it inclusive of companies, organizations, researchers, civil social leaders, all who are thinking deeply about the consequences, positive and negative. This isn't gonna happen overnight. It's gonna take many years to develop a sound, scalable and usable decentralized standard for social media that paves the path to solving the challenges listed above. Our commitment is to fund this work to that point and beyond. And this team, what this team is called, they're going to call it Blue Sky. And you can follow them here. Now, just to cap this off, I want to remind you just how big of a Bitcoin bull Jack is. So I've pulled some articles from him or of him over the last couple years. And we're just going to go through this list. So first of all, Jack regularly attends Bitcoin meetups all around the world. Jack buys Bitcoin on a regular basis. He's even alluded to cost averaging up to $10,000 per week. Many people have asked Jack if he's interested in other crypto coins. He just says, nope, just Bitcoin. But what is it about Bitcoin that excites Jack the most? He answers, everything. Mostly, I think it has the greatest chance of being the internet's native currency. And if you think of the internet as you would a country, that's huge. And generally speaking, of course, we all know how Jack is incorporating Bitcoin compatibility into basically every platform he oversees. This is Jack on Joe Rogan's show talking about Bitcoin on Square's Cash App. What was the, the <clears throat> thought process with, I mean, one of the things that's kind of cool about the Cash App is that you can buy and sell Bitcoin with it. Yeah. Um, are, you go, are you guys going to consider other forms of cryptocurrency as well? Not right now. I. 
So back to the internet, I believe the internet will have a native currency. Really? It'll have a native currency. And I don't know if it's Bitcoin. I, I think it will because just given all the tests it's been through and the principles behind it, how it was created and, um, you know, it was, it was something that was born on the internet that was developed on the internet, that it was tested on the internet. It, it, it is of the internet. And mm. the reason we, um, you know, we enabled uh, the purchasing of Bitcoin within within the Cash App is... One, we want to learn about the technology and we want to put ourselves out there and take some risk. We're the first publicly traded company to actually offer it as a service. We're the first publicly traded company to talk to the SEC about Bitcoin and what that what that means. And it it made us uncomfortable. We had to we had to, you know, like really understand what was going on and and that was critical and important. And then the second thing is that we, you know, we would we would love to see something become a global currency. It, it, it enables more access. It, it allows us to serve more people. It allows us to move much faster around the world. And um, we, uh, we, we thought we were going to start with how you can use it transactionally, but we noticed that people were treating it more like an asset, like a, like a virtual gold. And we wanted to, um, we wanted just to make that easy, like um, just the simplest way uh, to buy and sell Bitcoin, but we also knew that it had to come with a lot of education. It had to come with constraint because, you know, two years ago, people did some really unhealthy things about, you know, purchasing Bitcoin. They maxed out their credit cards and um, put all their life savings into into Bitcoin. So we we developed some very simple uh, restrictions and constraints, like you can you can't buy Bitcoin on the Cash App with a credit card. You have to, it has to be the money you actually have in it. And we look for day trading, which we, uh, we discourage and shut down. The future is bright, my friends. And you know what? Nobody knows what's going to happen with the price in the short term. I'm betting on the long term. That's me. And I, I think if you have perspective, it helps. Here, like this. This one time, Bitcoin went from six cents all the way to 36 cents, and then it crashed down to 21 cents and then another time bitcoin went from 85 cents all the way to 29 dollars and then it crashed to three dollars and then another time bitcoin went all the way to 213 dollars and then it crashed all the way to 70 dollars and then another time bitcoin went all the way to eleven hundred dollars, and then it crashed all the way to two thirty nine dollars. So the moral of the story is: don't buy Bitcoin because you know it's going to crash again. I think that more and more people are going to opt in to using Bitcoin as a store of value and a hedge against traditional markets. I think more and more people are going to opt into Bitcoin versus gold because as Bitcoin gains more awareness and gains more trust, people are going to realize that it's much harder to confiscate Bitcoin if you do it right. And a lot of people don't realize that governments and kingdoms have been confiscating gold throughout history. I mean, more than that, the U.S. government has confiscated gold in its history. And even more than that, the U.S. government has confiscated gold in its recent history. And this is a recent case. So 2012, a judge ruled that 10 gold coins worth $80 million belonged to the U.S. government and not to the family that ended up suing the Treasury because they said it has it was illegally seized from them. Check this out. So first of all, this explains why these coins were worth so much. And it, uh, one of the reasons is because almost all of these coins were um, uh, were melted down into gold bars. So there wasn't a lot of these coins remaining, except a Philadelphia mint cashier managed to give or sell some of these coins to a local dealer, Israel Swit. And the point is, in 2003, Switt's family, his daughter, Joan, and two grandsons drilled open a safety deposit box that, ha that had belonged to him and found these 10 rare gold coins worth millions of dollars. When the Lambords gave the coins to the Philadelphia Mint for authentication, the government seized them without compensation to the family. 
Um, they're suing the government, saying the coins belong to them. In 2011, a jury decided that the coins belonged to the government. And the point is, Bitcoin fixes this. All right, guys. All right, guys. I'll see you tomorrow.